All right, let's pray. Father, we're grateful for our church. We pray that you would lead our church, Father, into clarity about our mission at this point and where we're headed and put us in a place where we can minister to a community. That's my desire anyway. And that you would protect our nation from the evil that's upon it. And that you'd use that evil, Father, to purify the church. To bring about an experiential, uh, practical sanctification in the lives of the church. And, and awaken the church from its entertaining and focus on prosperity into a necessity. You're going to use the adversities that are coming as a necessity for us to wake up to the day-to-day -day life. That if you have enough for today, it's enough. Pray for the church, Father. So, I pray that you'd give us wisdom today and Ron taught earlier in what we're doing right now and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. When I got saved, I never struggled with eternal security like some. I was fortunate that my parents didn't, didn't force church upon me. Uh, so I really didn't have a lot of religious uh, programming to deprogram. So when, when I was saved and they told me that God was my father, that, I mean, I had a really loving father, I thought, well, that's a good thing. And the idea of losing my salvation, I mean, I heard that, and I had one guy tell me that, but I just, it never, so, so I went into the eternal security pretty simple. But with a bootlegger background, in a lascivious trend a mile long, I struggled to live what's considered the Christian life. It's a good thing for me that I wasn't an, hadn't, didn't have an ascetic trend because I would have become religious and thought, I'm good. But instead, I struggled with sins that most people would think of as sins, with this experiential or what I call practical sanctification, positional sanctification at salvation, opens the door to the transformation process, which is practical sanctification in this life, leading us to permanent salvation, or ultimate, as Ron said, in eternity. So we're in the practical sanctification phase, phase two, if you will. And that's where the difficulty for me always was, I suspect for, for all of us, because it requires so much learning so much understanding, and when you got saved, you were put into union with Christ. At the same time, you were indwelt by the Spirit. Paul says, the, the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside you. Is that right? Power that raised Jesus from the dead. God the Holy Spirit the third member of the Godhead, the Trinity that created with the spoken word. How much power is that? A lot of power, right? We begin to learn the word of God, which, you know, the grass grows up and withers and burns up, but the what? The word of God stands forever. So as a young believer, I had the Holy Spirit and I had the word of God in my soul. That's two most powerful things in the universe. Paul did too. I want to read you Paul's description of the Christian experience. With the Holy Spirit and the eternal powerful Word of God. Starting in Romans 7, reading 14 through 25. He says, we know the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh. Sold into bondage to sin. That's the slave market. For, what, for, for that which I am doing, I don't really understand. In other words, I don't know what I'm doing. For I'm not doing, practicing, what I want to do. But, in fact, I'm doing the very thing that I hate to do. But, so, he says, therefore, 
if I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do, I agree with the law, confessing the law is good because the law revealed that you're a sinner. When you sin, the law was there to say you're a sinner. So here's Paul. He says, the thing that I want to do, I, I find myself doing these things in my life that I hate. And the law shows me that sin. So, he says, so now, it's no longer I that's doing this, but the sin nature which is indwelling my body. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That's, that word good is agathos. It's the word Jesus said, only God is agathos. He called him good teacher. He said, why do you call me good? Only, only God is agathos. So, nothing of divine good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the desire is present in me to do the good. But the doing of the good is not. For the good I want to do, I don't do. Instead, I practice the very evil I don't want to do. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? I mean, that was my life. I mean, I wanted to live for the Lord, but I found myself living for me. I mean, I still find myself living for me. That's going to be my point. So the very thing I don't want to do, I am, he said, it's no longer me doing it, but the sin nature dwelling in me. I find then this principle, that evil is present in me, the very one who wishes to do good. I joyfully occur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law or principle in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Now, here's my point. You're saved, you're secure, you're indwelt by the Spirit, you have the Word of God, and still this is your life. What is it that's so powerful about this old way that it holds on to us so hard that after 40 years I still am struggling with it? You go, what's your sin nature? I go, okay. Very clearly it's what he said, it's a sin nature. But I don't think it's just a sin nature. And I know, you, I know you know where I'm headed with that. It's more than just a nature. It's a whole way of thinking about things. And, and, and that's what has to be challenged. These patterns that we developed in our life have to be broken. And that requires more than just confessing sin and getting back in fellowship and then going about your way. It requires more of you if you're going to break these patterns. If you're going to continue in these patterns, then okay, and confess your sins and say, I'm living the Christian life. Okay, I know, but it's not. It's not living the Christian life. It's not growing. You say, well, I'm growing in knowledge. Okay, that's potential. That's potential. See, growing is changing in the inner man what you think, believe, feel, want, desire, and do. So, I wanted to look, I wanted to introduce the idea that even though we have all this power, we still struggle back and forth, back and forth. James calls it being double-minded. And why? And what do we do about it? Romans chapter 6, and, and Paul's doing this in the book of Romans. He, later on, he does it in several other books, even more detail, but... In 6, 7, and 8 especially, he's going to deal with this topic of the inner man. He's not gonna, when he gets to chapter 8, he's really going to show you how this works. But if you go back to Romans chapter 6, you have Bibles? Romans chapter 6. I want to show just a few things. This is my Sunday night study. I'm doing a more of an expanded version of this on Sunday night on, on Zoom. Um, in chapter 6, Paul's going to lay out the transfer from our position in Adam 
into the kingdom of the beloved son. That's Colossians 1.13. And in this transfer of position, you know, we're born into Adam. When you're saved, you're transferred into Christ. You become in union with Christ. And in this position, it creates the possibilities for the believer to experience victory over the sin patterns. He calls it the body of sin. And live according to the mind of Christ. So, really what I'm after is these possibilities. Now, Ron talked about it in the first uh, session with the three optatives. This is Paul's desire for these believers. The optative is, the, is, like, is a wish, it's a hope. <laughs> it's kind of a distant hope, but, you know, Peter says, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, and he says it in the optative, which means I wish you did, but you're probably suffering because of your own choices. You know? But, so chapter 6, we're going to see the position from, Christ, from Adam to Christ and the possibilities that opens up. Chapter 7, he's going to explain in the first part, freedom from the law, and then describe this inner conflict we, we, that we just read. In chapter 8, especially the first eight verses, he's going to say that our position in Christ has freed us from all the condemnation in Adam. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ. No condemnation. See, part of living the practical sanctification, spiritual life, is beginning with the fact that there's no condemnation when you fail. You can't get up and run again if every time you fail, you think everything's bad. Have you ever seen a kid learn to walk? How many times do they fall down? Over and over again. One day, but what do they do? Grab hold and get back up. That's the Christian life. If every time your kid failed, you went, you stupid kid. They would never get back up, would they? They'd lay there still so that you wouldn't, they wouldn't be criticized. You know, some people live their whole Christian life like that, trying not to do anything wrong so that they don't mess up and, be, and, and they're criticized. Some people live their whole life like that. Fear of being criticized, fear of disapproval. So they live in this tight little box, and they have no freedom. That's not the Christian life, folks. That's religion. If your Christian life is this little box where you just don't do anything wrong, no wonder we have no impact. We're just trying not to do anything wrong. I'm speaking to somebody. So our position in Christ has freed us from condemnation, while the ministry of the, the God, the Holy Spirit, frees us to focus not on, on, on rejecting our old thinking stored in the flesh and focus on walking in the Spirit and living out the new man. See, the whole thing boils down to where you focus your mind. Where you focus your mind. If you focus your mind on the things of the flesh... See, you have desire, and I, I've got it all laid out here. I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but your desire is what drives you in life. It shows you that you have a need. Desire is the motivator of the soul. Now, you can attach desire to the flesh, which is what we initially do in our life. Initially, we attach our desire. You know why we do that? It's all we have. We don't have God. So initially in life, we attach our desire, i.e. our needs, to people and the things of the world and our body and pleasures and whatever brings you pleasure. See, the lascivious trend likes bodily pleasures. The ascetic trend likes pleasures of other kinds, like keeping everything clean and orderly and straight. You know, you can go into a little classroom of kids and you'll see one kid's got his stuff all over the place. He don't care. 
The next little kid's got everything straight, right? They care. That's their pleasure, is having everything straight. That's asceticism. So, this desire that we attach either way with the focus by focusing our mind. See, you have this desire and you focus your mind on the flesh, producing sin. Or, as a believer, you can focus your mind on the spirit, and that produces righteousness in your life. It produces growth. You get to walking in the spirit. It's where you focus your mind. Now, that's Romans 8. So, Let's just do a little textual study here. Paul develops his discussion by using a series of rhetorical and practical questions. In fact, he asks 58 different questions in the book of Romans. 58. He, he moves. See, here's what was happening. They were moving from life under the law into life free from the law under faith and grace. And they had a lot of questions about how that works. It took me years to understand the difference between grace and faith and works. God wants works, but how, what's a, an appropriate work? He doesn't, you don't work to please God, so you don't really get that straight in your life about faith and works until your motives begin to straighten out a little bit. And you realize that God wants works, but only those works that come from your love for him, your desire to work into the kingdom, and to obey. See, if you're working to get something from God, he rejects that. If you're working because you already got something from God, he loves that. See the difference? Paul's trying to straighten that out. That's why in chapter 4 he talks about Abraham. He said, the Christian life is not wages. You don't work. Abraham's working was not something God blessed him because he deserved it. Okay? He said, that's works. There's no, there's no uh, grace and works don't go together. He said, it was all faith and grace. Grace and faith. All right? Chapter 5, he gets into that. Oh, he talks about what Adam did and then what Christ did in chapter 6 here. We're in chapter 6. He's going he's gonna to get into the uh, discussion of the Christian life. And in, in chapter 6, verse 1, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. No, and then here's another question. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Here's another question. Or do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? It's all questions. See, he's setting up an argument. This is what he does in Romans. This is like a big dissertation. This is not your regular letter, hey, hello, how's it going? This is a dissertation. This is like a doctoral thesis here. So, all right. So in chapter 6, verse 1, should we keep on sinning? And look, this is what Paul's being accused of. When he said the law, we're no longer under law, you know what they said? Are you crazy? How are you going to keep people from just doing whatever they want? You ever heard that before? Same question. Now, if you look at verse 15, he divides the cha this chapter can be divided this way. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? See, the same basic question. They're, the Jews were telling him, well, how are you going to keep people from sinning? You know what he said? I'm not. I'm not. Because it's not the issue. Not sinning is not the point. It's not the goal. Living for Christ is the goal. And along that path, there's going to be lots of sinning in and out, up and down, failure, success, failure, 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 success, two steps forward, one step back. It's messy. It's messy when you win. Now, if you're just trying not to lose, it's not messy. It's just locked up. I don't think God's interested in that. 
seeing how well you can control your own self. Not at all. So, now we look at this position. He talks about, he says, don't you know if you've been baptized into Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, you're, bab- you're identified with his death. Therefore, we, in this verse 4, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might be raised from the dead and walk. See, here's your first subjunctive mood. Here's your first possibility. So that we too might walk in newness of life. There's your experience. There's your new man living. New man living is walking in newness of life. Okay? That's your first possibility. Your position in Christ has opened up this possibility of walking in newness of life. Here's the new man living that's been made possible. But it's a subjunctive mood which says it's a possibility. It's not a certainty, and it's dependent on your choices. Then the next one, he says, he goes on to say in verse 5, For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank God for that. Now, he says, and he's going to use this phrase a couple of times in this chapter as well. He said, I need you to know something. Knowing is everything in the Christian life. If you don't know, then all you have is emotion. So he said, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him so that, and here's your second possibility, our body of sin might be destroyed or done away with so that we should no longer live as slaves to sin. This is really what I was after in this chapter personally, but this word katargeo means to be torn down. It means to be rendered inoperative. And he's talking about not only the old sin. Now see, if he's talking about the old sin nature, which is in the body, we can't, we can't get rid of that, can we? So what's he talking about? This old self being torn down. What's he talking about? I'll tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about the patterns of thinking, feeling, believing that we developed in our life that are still stored in our brain. See, he makes it clear in this chapter that it's in the body. Everything that we're fighting is in the body. He calls it the body of sin, the body of death. It's in the body. And you go, well, you can't get rid of the sin nature, so what are we talking about getting rid of here? We're talking about getting rid of the ideas and beliefs that we developed based on the sin nature out of the devil's world. This stuff's stored in the neurons of your brain. And here you over in the new man, and every time you let go of the Holy Spirit, boom, you go right back into this old stuff. And you go, well, you know, I used to do a lot of stuff that I don't do now. I said, well, that's called growth, maybe, hopefully. But, you know, there's a lot of things that we still do under the surface stuff. See, as a counselor... Early in my Christian life, somehow I got identified that way. Had seemed to have a knack for talking to people about what was going on and helping them. And I began to realize that, I mean, people didn't bring to me questions about how to stop fornicating. That was an obvious thing. Don't fornicate. But they'd say, I'm, I'm so afraid. I'm full of anxiety. I'm depressed. I'm so discouraged. I'm jealous, worried. You go, well, what do you do about that stuff? I mean, is that stuff from God? Listen, are we supposed to live this outwardly superficial religious type life and then be filled with insecurities and worries and discouragement and depression? Is that the Christian life? I don't think so. I think there's a deeper level to all this, and I've talked about it for years. It's a deeper deeper level of dealing with your own Christian life. And it's a very personal level. And it's your option. See, it's a subjunctive mood. It's your option. Your possibility to dig into that and, and and go deeper in your heart with God. 
Because all of that stuff that you've held on to hinders your ability to be open and trust God and also to live freely in your life. To live freely. Live, to do your life because you want to do your life. Not because you're afraid of what will happen if you don't. So I don't think that's a legitimate way to live, personally. I don't live that way anymore. I used to. I used to not be able to say no. <laughs> I mean, I was a really good worker when I came because the boss over there, he'd be, he's good at putting you to work. I mean, I had a lot of jobs because I couldn't say no. And then one day, I grew up and said, you know, <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't do anymore. In fact, I'm doing more than I should. And I got smart. I got smart about me and the Lord. And I started listening to the Lord instead of listening to people. Started trying to please the Lord instead of pleasing people. See the difference? This is the stuff that Paul's talking about that we can overcome and remove. He goes on to say these possibilities are to walk in newness of life and then he says you can tear down these old patterns of thinking so that, and here's an infinitive, an aorist infinitive, so that you should no longer be enslaved to your sin nature. See, there's something that has to be torn down to free you from being a slave to your sin nature. And we know it's not the sin nature, so it's the beliefs and the, and the thinking that goes along with that. He goes on to talk about practical victory. If you look at verse 12 of chapter 6, he says, Therefore, stop allowing the sin nature to, to be in charge inside your mortal body so that you should obey its desires. All right? Now, I want you to understand that this word desire... Uh, epithumia is the word often translated lust and it's used in two different ways one it's used as far as the desires that come out of the sin nature and the old way of thinking it's also used to talk about uh, desires for the Lord so if you'll turn real quickly over to Galatians 5 one of our favorite passages in this church 16 and 17 who knows what that says? You know that one? You know that one? Galatians 5, 16 and 17. But I say, walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Watch verse 17. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit sets its desires against the flesh. These are in opposition to each other so that you may not do the things you want, just like Romans 7. You end up doing things you didn't want to do because you've got this inner struggle. And what's the inner struggle about? Your desires. It's desires. So the question is, does, what do you do with your desires? You know, you can't quit desiring if you quit desiring, you basically quit living. It's just where you attach your desires. What do you look to to fulfill your desires? That's where he's going to say in Romans 8, this word phreneo, to focus your mind. Here you're desiring something, which means you're alive. What do you attach that desire to and believe will fulfill your desire? That's, the, that's how you win or lose. If you choose to focus your mind on those things from the flesh and the sin nature and the old way of thinking, so you can be religious as the day is long and still not be spiritual and still... I, I've got a person right now that's struggling with OCD, if you know what that is. Compulsively clean. And I don't mean just clean compulsively clean. They clean everything up, scrub the baseboards and the shoe mold and everything, and they get finished, and you know what they have to do? They have to do it again. That's OCD. So, this person is spending their whole life cleaning things that are already clean. And, and 
Many people would say, well, boy, you got the most spotless house. Boy, you're a great Christian. See, that's fear-based. It's fear that if I don't keep it just exactly the way it should be, then something bad's going to happen or somebody's going to say something critical to me. It's living to not fail. That's OCD. That's what it's about. It's a fear thing. Images of being hurt, being criticized, being disapproved of. All right? So these are the types of things that really get down into the Christian life. And if you were living on an island by yourself, just you and the Lord, it might be fine to keep all that stuff, although not really. But are you married? Are you in a relationship with another human being? Then all of this stuff counts. I mean, when you're, I mean, this person, this lady is married. Her husband's like, can you not just come and relax and watch a TV show? Everything is consumed by this need to keep everything just so, so that the relationships in this person's life. And, and listen, do you know what happens when he leaves his coffee cup on the table? Imagine the tension in that room, right? Now, do you think that's interfering with this lady's marriage? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You think that the Lord would like to free her from that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. This is the kind of stuff my ministry, and listen, in this church, and all you've really ever known of me is that I, because you have a teacher already, who deals with all the basics of the Christian life, I'm privileged and free to be able to talk about because this is what interests me. This is the stuff I do for fun. And this is fun to me. It may be like pulling teeth for you, but... So I see these things in the scriptures that talk about dealing with these deeper things of life. And I have come to realize as 40 years in ministry that those people who have the courage to look at themselves and deal with those things in their life have a much sweeter, peaceful Christian existence, and they also have a greater impact on their relationships. The more you get yourself out of the way, the more God is free to flow through your life. This ladies' ministry that Jackie's bringing here with some missionaries... This is what it's about. It's about people who've been deeply hurt, scarred through trauma. And this ministry that she's bringing in is about helping these people begin a process of healing from that and allowing the Lord back into that part of their life. You know, you know you've healed from a trauma in your life when not only can you look at it and be honest about it and deal with it, but when you're grateful for it. Only when you come to that place where you're grateful that God allowed it for whatever growth it produced in your life and for whatever he personally in his plan got out of it, then you're looking at it from his eyes. Father, I appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas. To me, they're precious and necessary if we, should, if we would advance beyond just the surface and go beyond just knowledge and understanding to an application that from the heart, from the soul, from the core of our being, we're able to lay aside that, those hurts and the pains and the reactions and the insecurities and the fears and to be free of that and to live by faith in the Son of God, and to, to love freely without fear of being hurt or being rejected, to, to love in spite of rejection, just like Christ. That's our goal, Father. That's why this church exists, and I pray that you would bring us to that place and ask it in Christ's name. Amen.